Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started with the, with the discussion. I realize we're all still sort of munching on our lunches, and, but at least I'm glad that we're munching and that you got fed one way or another. Uh, so our, my uh, um, apologies to, for uh, Dan Roden, who is unable to make it to the meeting today. He had a, a family emergency and then a travel problem. And so, um, so I'm going to play Dan for the, uh, uh, the session today, uh, which, which are, are tough shoes to fill, but I will do my best. Um, so I, I realize we, you know, we've had a little bit of a break um, since we heard about the, the initial uh, discussions on, on international experience, um, but I, I wondered if there are uh, uh, questions to start or if we can kind of stimulate some. Uh, so so you, you'll recall we heard about uh, Europe from Dr. Mückenhaupt, um, uh, about Taiwan from Dr. Hung, uh, the ISEC from uh, Dr. Pierre Mohammed, and, and Thailand from Dr. Chantertita. So are there uh, questions or comments to start off with? <clears throat> this um, isn't um, pertained to the differences in um, the talks that were given today, but um, I mean, um, right before this break. But um, one thing I, I, that struck me is that um, some of the alleles that are associated with um, with these hypersensitivities, and I know Elizabeth has thought, thought about this before, um, are actually ligands for uh, killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptors. And um, they're expressed on natural killer cells, and natural killer cells are one of the cell types that make granulysin. So um, I was wondering whether um, some of the, um, <laughs> for example, with the back of the ear, some of the individuals who, who are B57 positive but do not develop hypersensitivity, um, whether it may be modulated by cure interactions. So if you didn't have an appropriate, uh, if you had strongly inhibitory cure, um, might that reduce the granulysin production and confer some protection against that subset of B57 people who don't develop disease? And that could be applied to any of these, not so much the 1502, B1502, because that's a BW6, and that's not a ligand for any cure. So I wouldn't expect cure involvement in that. But I'm just wondering if there, you know, because some of you were talking about modifiers of of um, specific <laughs> HLA effects, that it's not just the HLA allele, but there may be genetic modifiers, and whether anyone's looked at, in those, because um, I, I can tell you on GWAS, the Kier locus, because it's expanded and contracted so much, um, that locus is very poorly covered on, um, on GWAS chips. And even for full genome sequencing, it's a messy region because sometimes there are 15 genes and sometimes there are only four. <laughs> so we actually did um, genotyping, here genotyping in the, and, and this is sort of, we're hopefully just about finished. And once we're finished the last part of it, that doesn't involve here, but in the Abacavir predict co well predict plus cohorts. So it was basically 95 patch test positives versus 43 5701 tolerance. And there was no difference in sort of and we did the complete here genotyping. So there was no difference between those populations. Uh, but I think there is some interesting data with Neverapine and I I sort of welcome sharing that with you later. So thanks. Great, and I should note that uh, that we were added by Dr. Mary Carrington from uh, um, the National Cancer Institute in in Frederick. No, that's that's quite all right, and and also by Dr. Howard McLeod um, from Moffitt, Florida. So where it's sunny and nice, and why in the world would you have trouble flying in? <laughs> uh, oh, really? Okay. Great. Further comments. So I was wondering if we, we might talk a bit about international collaborations. Uh, obviously, we heard from two, two large and, and effective ones in the, uh, uh, the Registrar and the, and the ISEC, uh, but there are, are a number of other groups that could conceivably be collaborating with your two groups. And so I wonder, Dr. Dr. Muckenhaupt, if you could, could talk a little bit about, um, sorry if you're in, in mid-chew, but, um, but uh, uh, how, how you might be able to expand your network or, or take on you know, potentially affiliate members or ancillary member. 
Well, I have not really shown how many teams are around right now in the Registrar group, but I think our Taiwanese colleagues have. So there's European, several European teams, there's Taiwan, there's South Africa. Um, and we're open for other teams to join. It's only that, for the moment, every team has to provide some own funding. We have a hard time struggling to be funded and survive. Um, and uh, we had some European um, funding from the European Commission for a few years, but they usually like to initiate things um, and not to do a continuous funding, which is a problem because for some people research starts when you have all the samples, you have all done the, um, the data management, everything is set, and then they start with their samples. Uh, but all this other thing has to be financed by research money. So the point is, um, they need people, it needs a lot of interest and also frustration tolerance <laughs> to start that, and uh, some initial funding. But we have always helped people if they wanted to join to come to our meetings and things like that. The basic requirement is that a network is set up, that the cases are interviewed according to the uh, register rules and questionnaires and then people um, get access to the database which is remote database entry and the cases are reviewed together uh, in one setting but we are open for that but each team has to do the legal issues because they are still different France has different rules for ethical committees than Germany or the Netherlands so there's a few things that we can help with um, and it can be set up, and then there, a start is possible from one place, not the entire country. For example, we now have a team from Spain, they started with two hospitals, and now they're covering the entire area of larger Madrid, and it works very well. Great, thank you. Yes, Mark. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that because <clears throat> the question arose, and this is actually going to come back at you, Terry. Um, which is what would be the role of an eMERGE or one of the other NHGRI funded networks that is in the space of looking at, uh, um, uh, you know, phenotypes and, and, uh, and genotypes and uh, while I, and one of the questions, the reason I asked Dr. Perot Ahmed the, the question about the electronic data um, access is how amenable that would be and this also uh, anticipates uh, Josh's talk to a bit. But it seems to me that there would be an opportunity within the, some of the funded consortia uh, from NHGRI and others to contribute data to some of these international efforts. So I guess I'd appreciate your comments on that. Sure. And, and for those who aren't familiar with uh, the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network uh, is a, a program uh, initiated by uh, the, our institute uh, about eight years ago or so that really was set up to do genome-wide association studies within uh, biorepositories that had electronic medical records. At the, at the time we set that up, GWAS was just sort of getting started and there were a lot of questions as to whether uh, um, EMR-defined phenotypes would be nearly good enough to, to do um, uh, genome-wide studies and, and we proved happily that they, uh, they were, you know, more than adequate and, and in fact led to some very interesting extensions where you kind of turn GWAS on its head and, and Josh Denny may probably won't have a chance to talk about some of the very nice work that he did in, in doing phenome-wide association studies where you, you take a, a variant and then say, well, what else is this variant related to on the, on the phenotypic side? Um, so, so that would be, would be one group that could, could participate. The numbers of patients, you know, need to be large in order to, to pick up cases of this if you're dealing with the uh, groups that are not at risk, but you noticed at the beginning of, of my talk, I identified a number of other institutes that are in the room here and that are working with you uh, that have large cohorts of people who are on carbamazepine or on nevirapine or abacavir or other things. There, there are huge, huge collaborations, of, of, you know, related to HIV AIDS and, and that that are, are funded by um, our sister institutes and, and all. So, you know, might there be some way to consider um, uh, participating in some way? Uh, and, and, you know, presumably many of these groups are collecting information on a lot of things anyway, so it might not be a huge marginal cost to, to add in a questionnaire for the rare case that, that develops this condition, which is something that, you know, you're probably going to try to document anyway. Wouldn't it be nice to have a standard form to do that? Munir. So, so just with regard to the SAC, um, it was funded to do the 
each consortium in terms of numbers, and we've reached that target. Um, and, and what we're trying to do at the moment is to identify potential hits using the GWAS studies and, and other, other functional studies sometimes. But what one of the aspects that we're finding is that uh, uh, we do need to collaborate with other people. So some of, the, um, some of the signals I showed you do need to be replicated. So if there are people who have the relevant samples here who want to follow on and, and collaborate with us in terms of replicating the samples, that would be uh, much appreciated. Um, I think, um, you know, in terms of follow on to the SAEC, um, obviously, and, and, and Maya is quite right that often from funding agencies you get funding to start off something, but you don't often get recurrent funding to continue it over 10 years, 15 years, and so on. And that is what is, what is needed. Um, and the way we're trying to do that in the UK is um, two ways. One is to have the infrastructure funding to the uh, kind of uh, structures I showed you before, but also actually working with patients. So we've, we've set up a, a patient group which is called SJS Awareness UK. And through their contacts and through Facebook, would you believe, they were able to find me more patients with SJS TEN within a year than I was able to find it for five previous years. And by going back to the case notes, uh, we were able to look at those and validate those and, and utilize them for some of our studies. The pr problem obviously always is that you know, retrospectively, the case notes may not have enough information in there, so you may not be able to completely recruit uh, uh, all, all, all of the cases. Uh, prospective design obviously is very good to have, but it's expensive and, and because of the rarity you may not be able to collect enough and you may need to go for many years to be able to collect enough. And so retrospective cases may still be valid to be able to recruit, especially if you can identify what the case criteria are and if there's enough information, particularly some of the things that uh, Neil talked about in terms of histology, uh, etc., uh, is available for you to be able to validate uh, those cases. So I think that is very important. Um, coming back to electronic medical records. Actually, um, actually maybe could I, I'll just stop you for just a moment because when you mentioned having patients actually contact you, we have um, um, Andrea from a, a patient group. And Andrea, maybe you introduce yourself and say. I'm Andrea Dalton. Um, is this on? Okay. From. Um, okay. I'm Andrea Dalton from the Stevens Johnson Syndrome Foundation. We have a database of over 3,500 patients from all around the world. We put out uh, questionnaires as well, and we would offer collaboration for studies, which we tried to put together for people, um, mainly with regards to the sequelae that come out of SJS as well. If we could help that, it would be very, very good. But the database is very important. We take calls night and day, and usually our website is the go-to for people who have never heard of Stevens-Johnson syndrome before, and they're wondering what's going on with them, and you know they're usually missed one, two, three times before someone finally gets it. And by that time, there is you know full uh, slough of the skin. You know, uh, they are very well spoken and would be happy to come forward and advocate and talk about what happened to them, especially around the world, if we can help. We will. Great. And you commented that you, you do refer them to clinical trials or to other studies as well? Yes, absolutely. And we try to put together clinical trials, stem cell re research, mainly for the ocular involvement, which everybody seems to suffer from, whether it is full blindness, severe phot photophobia, or dry eye syndrome. It always seems to be the biggest issue, as well as, which we can't seem to figure out, is the joint pain. And that is something I have not found any articles on that. So if anybody knows why this happens, I would please come and talk to me. Because when people call, they ask me, where should I go? And naturally, I say rheumatology, and they don't know how to figure it out. So. It's just a big mystery sometimes, and I often say when patients with SJS get out of the hospital, they're usually at their best because the sequelae seem to come later on as it develops, you know, especially with the ocular involvement, and then other things seem to happen with the fingers, the fingernails, the toenails, the teeth, and all the mucosal surfaces. 
Thank you. So, so uh, Andrea Dalton, and she's here, and, and I think uh, very eager to, to develop collaborations. So, sorry to, to interrupt you, Munir. No, that, that was very useful, actually. Um, just to, uh, I'll talk to Andrea later, but, but, but uh, that's very important. So I, I think the SGS Awareness UK group have been in contact with the group here, and in order to increase uh, awareness of SGS, we, um, I act as a patron of the charity. It's now a charity in the UK, and we were able to get some funding for them to be able to develop their own website and things like that. In order to increase awareness, we were able to persuade um, and a member of parliament to actually launch the charity in the House of Parliament uh, in, in the UK. Um, and, and we are trying to persuade uh, them to have an SJS Awareness Week in July this year. So that it increases the awareness of SJS. And, and I think that's very important um, uh, as, as part of the sort of education of doctors, other people to be able to recognize it. Because one of the biggest issues that comes from them when they talk to me is that uh, people are late in recognizing the potential danger signs and carry on with the drug, don't ask, take a good drug history, etc. and the drug is carried on. I think stopping the drug is, is, is crucially important in the early stages. Um, so, so I, I think that's important. So, I, I, you know, I, that I was very useful. Now, I, I, can, I, I would like to talk to Andrea later on if that's okay. Um, the, the, in terms of the electronic medical records, um, so when I did do the analysis on the electronic medical records, it wasn't a UK-based database, but uh, th there were issues in terms of how the cases were. There was ICD coding saying that there was Stephen John syndrome, toxic hepatomonocrosis, but when you actually looked at them, there was. Clearly, uh, they weren't in terms of the kind of data that was provided. So it's very difficult for me to be able to even recruit one case from that electronic healthcare record. Um, so, but we have been trying in the UK to start doing that. So we've uh, undertaken, there's something called the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, which links 10 million people uh, in the UK at the moment. Um, and uh, we've, we've started off with a different phenotype, which was statin myopathy, and able to identify those cases and have been able to validate the case definition and then validate some of the associations which have already been found. Um, and, and we've now started to develop a diagnostic algorithm to be able to identify patients with drug-induced liver injury, let's say to flucloxacillin. Um, but now uh, we're starting to think about in within the electronic health record how we can develop the diagnostic algorithm for SJS, TEN, because it's so rare, so therefore you do need to go into electronic health records to be able to really identify those cases. And in terms of, I, I think we'll hear a lot about the electronic phenotyping from Josh and others uh, later this afternoon. In, in terms of, of collaboration with you, um, I know the SAEC was was set up to be a, a you know global uh, consortium and collaboration. But how how would people you know you go to your website and yeah. and you find out what, what the criteria are and how to join or. For, for, for what I've shown you today, it's all on the SAC website in terms of what we're doing. We've also published in terms of the criteria we're using in clinical pharmacology therapeutics. So they can either contact me in terms of they want to replicate or Arthur Holden, and we work together to be able to help uh, work with them collaboratively to be able to replicate some of the signals we've already identified. Wonderful. Great. Back here. Uh, Matt Nelson, yes. I'm Lisa Smith Climb. I'm also the chair of the Serious Adverse Event Consortium uh, Scientific Management Committee. Um, so part of our bylaws is the SAEC, a year after the data are generated, those, ge those data become publicly available. So right now those are being hosted on the ISAEC website. Um, so almost every, everything that we've published to date, the uh, clinical as well as the genetic data, genome-wide genotype data, are available for download. It's a fairly simple process to essentially acknowledge the, the conditions for, for use of the data and then to, to download it. The data that uh, Munir talked about today uh, will be up there in the coming months as well. So, so all of that uh, is expected to be, to be ready. Um, the ISAEC itself is in its sunset period. Um, so uh, we're not continuing any new project at this point, although the individual uh, component studies like itch uh, may continue on in their, own, uh, in their own ways. Great, thank you. So in terms of, of other forms of um, um, 
kind of global lessons that we can learn. We, again, heard from two large consortia and two much smaller um, sort of local or um, um, individualized uh, uh, settings in which uh, we heard very promising things about implementation of, of uh, uh, screening and, and use of, of genetic testing to prevent this uh, terrible condition. And so one wonders, what is it that's, that's unique or unusual about those, those settings that enables that to happen? And I, I think, you know, we heard a couple of things, one of them being, you know, there has to be an appreciable prevalence or, or incidence, much higher probably than what we see in, in the U.S. and, and perhaps in, in other countries. But at least it needs to be recognized as a, as a significant health problem where enough people can relate to it that, uh, that you can get some attention. Um, also, you need to have a, a relatively higher frequency of the, of the risk alleles. Uh, but it seems also that there needs to be sort of a, a receptive um, uh, governmental interest in this. And so I, I wonder if, if when Hung, perhaps you could, you could comment on what was it in Taiwan that, that made this work? Was there an, an individual champion? Was there somebody in, in your government who said, this is a terrible thing, or I had a, you know, a son who had it, or, or whatever? Or was it, was it much more of a kind of a, uh, an understanding, you know, in, in general, that, that this was something that needed to be addressed? In, in Taiwan, the situation is, for Kao Zanpin, the, the story is more straightforward <laughs> because uh, the, the government puts the, the information and uh, we have a post-based study, then the, 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 the test is covered by insurance. So, but for after the Kao Zanpin story, then the government changed to be more conservative now, just such like Arapuino, and we, we, we did have labels Arapuino, but <clears throat> um, there are a couple of things now to be uh, they, they need to consider not just the genetic test uh, because they are now have an alternative new drug, and uh, they they also know that the, the test cannot cover one hundred percent to protect the patient. So more more and more that uh, protocol uh, sort of should be should be uh, put together, and also the price uh, the, the genetic test or so, so called the pharmacoeconomic analysis. So uh, we need to think about. How to uh, put the clinical implantation of the genetic test, and so uh, Kawanami is a good uh, example. But now we are struggling to to make the Arapino could be one of the uh, another successful pharmacogenomic test in in Taiwan. So I think we, uh, 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 but I think Taiwan is is a small area, so it's very, very it's a, our expert can put the uh, government to do to, to something is. Easier, easy. I think it's easier for us uh, compared to the state. I think more complicated. Yes. And and in Taiwan because our population is more homogeneous, so we don't. Uh, the the one thing is what we want to do or not. So for for us, I think it's more easier. So, and then the, some of the researchers come from Taiwan, so I think we have chance. But I'm thinking, uh, uh we we we. Oh, we, uh, in previous we we do the the, the research by ourselves and uh, the, and also the prospective genetic test also doing by Taiwan. So I'm thinking is is someday um the, the if the 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 NIH can lead uh, not lead but participate in our our ongoing uh, prospective screen that will be appreciated because and such like in Thailand and if you can participate our to monitor and to to improve our quality of uh, Prospective screening, or also the clinical implantation. I think we will be appreciated, not by research, but also by our government should be very appreciated. Okay. Thank you. I, I might ask Dr. Wasan also also to comment on what what made it feasible within Thailand to be able to to implement this screening. Was it uh, you know was there a government interest in in doing this? Was it something that was identified by the government necessarily as being something important, or did you bring it forward as as clinicians and say you know this is a terrible thing and it's something we can now do something about? Um, for for the uh, university hospital. You can do it Im immediately, and uh, the one who pays <clears throat> is the is the patient, not the government. But it's a little bit hard for the for us to push for the government. In case of the government, the first one I already told you is the capamazepine. We do the cost effectiveness, and it it works. That's why the government just support it. It we start with the 2014, and now one year. Now they under evaluate that the government should be implement nationwide, and the information perhaps this recommend can provide more 
for me because he's working with the government. Great, thank you. So I, I think for, for Thailand, we have several uh, fortunate factors. It was begin, it began 10 years ago. I think it's 2004 uh, that we started the pharmacogenetics projects. That was not, the, I mean, based on our policy. It was actually began because of McKinsey uh, went to Thailand because of our prime minister asked McKinsey to evaluate our biotechnology sector. And McKinsey suggested that we should do pharmacogenetics, which we, we don't know why in 2004 we should do pharmacogenetics. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then uh, the, the politician become interested in pharmacogenetics because of McKinsey recommendation. Uh, and then uh, later on, there was a finding from Taiwanese that uh, there was a genetics factor that we can use to prevent the uh, Steven 10 from carbazepine. And we know uh, I, uh, we have a, a senior epileptologist, and he is very influential in the epileptology, uh, uh, epilepsy uh, society. And he was very interested to having these tests available for the Thai people. So he, he is the one who, like uh, the champion of this test. And he, he has a, a very large network of connections. So he influenced many sectors in, in the government and the uh, university-based researchers. And then from his influential and the supporting policy, we uh, uh, receive, I mean, our technology uh, uh, people or capability was already mature, I think. We can develop the test that cost us only 30 US dollar. This is a little specific PCR for the 1502, so it's a simple PCR test, uh, really similar to uh, what the uh, private company in Taiwan is uh, developed, but it's, uh, the primary pair was uh, different. And then uh, based on that cheap, low-cost uh, typing technology, uh, the, the economic equation became uh, feasible. So uh, then that equation, when it becomes feasible, is, and the, 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 this problem is really a big problem in our country. We have 100 cases per year, every year, for many ten, uh, for, for decades. So it's a real problem, and even we don't have any uh, what is this? Uh, uh, Facebook of the patients. They they usually went up in the newspaper, in the lawsuit or or something. So uh, that's a very uh, many fortunate and unfortunate events combining together that make it feasible in our country. I think. No, that's an, an excellent point, and as you know, uh, I, my my impression from looking in the in the U.S. at various health systems that have have done this kind of work is is that there's a champion, there's there's somebody who recognizes the importance of it, um, and and pushes it forward, and and so it sounds like you have the same experience. So, good. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just also share uh, th that in Singapore it was also a fortunate convergence of uh, events. So the. Um, <clears throat> The chairman of the uh, board of the Health Sciences Authority, which is like the FDA, uh, was also um, chairman of or head of the executive director of the Genome Institute. And so he said to um, HSA staff, you know, genomics is the next wave of knowledge. You guys should figure out some way to apply the knowledge. And um, <clears throat> there was at that time a small amount of money that was set aside for innovative research in regulatory science, and so that's how uh, we got our start. Also, uh, there were, there are about 80 to 100 cases of SJSTEN per year in Singapore for a population of 5 million, so that's much higher than in the other parts of the world. So, And, and then another signal that um, uh, was um, troubling to us is that um, about a quarter of the cases of carbamazepine, SJSTN, were uh, people of Malay ancestry, and they're only 13% of the population. So that was a signal to us, some kind of um, maybe genetic component there. And of course, the work from Taiwan um, show, showing us that there is a high likelihood of a genetic association.
<clears throat> Great, thank you. No, those excellent comments. Mike, did I see your, your hand up? Or Okay, so, so last, last brief comment and then we'll move so on. I was going to follow up because I have been very fortunate to work both in Japan and Taiwan. So I, I, I did observe some commonality. So the first key, key, key uh, factor for the successful implementation is you have to have a very uh, important key proponent, proponent uh, supporter of the testing. So in Japan, I uh, was Yusuke Nagamura, in Taiwan was YT Chen, obviously. And I, I think the clinical trial uh, that's conducted in the country played an important part. Uh, early on, I think many physicians, they had reservations about genetic testing. But the clinical conducted, uh, well, in Japan, they have not published it yet. And in Taiwan, I think, you know, they, 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 they identify, you know, a key person uh, in medicine and get them to be involved in a trial, and that's a, you know the best way to make them see the benefit. And I think after that, you know the 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 the, the question really diminish. So 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 uh, the Japan is using the same strategy. They are conducting a clinical trial testing A three one O one for copper mass sampling, and they even look at the recruitment sites all over the country. So I, I think that's the only way, or well, 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 one of the important method to get a message across. If you have a trial in a country, and, and I think that basically will answer most of the criticisms that people have for, for genetic testing. Yeah. Excellent point, thank you. All right, um, so we'll move on then to, to sorry, uh, uh, very briefly. It's sort of around the same topic. Of the countries that sort of have the mandatory genetic testing, I guess the question that I have is more of an epidemiologist is do you have any evidence that the patients with seizure disorder are better off now that they're using a different drug after they've been tested for Tegretol and not using it? And do you have any evidence that there's fewer cases overall of Stevens Johnson TN in your country now that you're screening for 1502? Uh, since we <clears throat> uh, we issued a, a dear doctor letter saying that it's now considered standard of care, we haven't had a single case of carbamazepine SGSTN. That's not my question. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, because it they they used to con. Y yes. Uh, so they're mostly. Go, I think they're mostly being um, prescribed Kepra, the Veracetum, and uh, our our uh, letter said to avoid phenytoin as well in in 1502. So I, I think, but yes, uh, in the last two years, the t total number of SGST in cases has gone down. Is that do you agree? Great. We we do need to move on. Maybe you could you could have this conversation uh, after afterwards. Sorry, but uh, I don't want to I don't want to cut time off for our, our speakers. So um, great. So our, our next session is on uh, case finding and surveillance. Uh, the speakers have 20 minutes, and, and I will be ruthless in cutting you off at that time uh, so that we can allow time for questions. So um, uh, Dr. Lois Lagrenade from the Food and Drug Administration will be speaking on pharmacosurveillance uh, in the U.S.